Let's see if you start streaming. Hello, everyone. Let's see if we could get some people up here. Good girl. Public. Let me see. Let's see if I can get my hair. Hello, Brenda, how are you? Let's see if we can get some people on here. Is the volume okay? How you been? Hola, como estas? I hope you could see me. Home cart. There's seven viewers, apparently. Maybe. One like, how are you? Please comment if you can hear me good. Okay, so I have Mitchell, Ima, Iman, Iman, from New Jersey. Good evening. Yes, I'm loud and clear. Okay, because I have my mic down here. Um, I just wanted to come up here because there's something about editing lately. I'm like, mm. <laughs> good evening. Thank you for Jolene for liking my videos. Hi Judy from Iowa. How you guys doing? I wanted to come up here and do a live stream for like an hour maybe. And um, you can hear me good. I'm glad you guys could hear me. I finally kind of think I figured this out here and see how it's going to work. Um, I have my mic. I have to literally have the volume on YouTube completely off so it doesn't echo. So, um, let's see. How are you doing? How you been? I've been dealing with sickness lately, so I'm trying to kind of like recover. And then just to get myself to even want to uh, edit a video, it's like... We have Sandra here from Nashville, Tennessee. Ooh, 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 ooh. We have a New Jersey here. We have a New Jersey from Ringwood, New Jersey, that's kind of neat. We have a West Virginian here, West Virginia, West Virginia. <laughs> I hope you guys are okay. How you guys doing? Um, it's, I'm gonna ignore YouTube. Sometimes YouTube tells me that something's going on with my, whatever, we're gonna ignore, we're gonna keep on going. Sometimes if I don't have a lot of viewers, YouTube will kick me off. So if I get kicked off, I apologize. It's not me. Hello, Debbie from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Is that right? Someone's, I'm arguing with someone in text. <laughs> and she's texting me right now. Hold on, let me, some of you guys don't know how to behave. Uh, anyway, I'm just gonna ignore someone. So how are you doing? You guys are okay. I ended up um, having a stomach virus for like a couple of days. So it was hard for me to kind of get going for, I think this Monday, Tuesday, or this past Monday, Tuesday. So, and then it, I feel like I'm on catch up. I'm like always trying to catch up with work and trying to get my stuff together. So I'm trying to catch up with my physical work. And then I'm behind on my YouTube work. I know some of you wanted me to do videos on, I don't know, it's just, uh, it's, well, I, I just need to do videos. I just need to edit. I want to see if I could find an editor, but then I'm so used to editing my way, then I don't know if I'll trust an editor, but that's just the way I am. I'm glad you guys are here. How are you? I'm finally doing a lot better. Today I was going to sit for a couple hours and edit a video. And I said, you know what, maybe if I go on there and do a live stream, I could just catch up with them that way. We have Kim from Iowa. Hi, Kim. It's kind of neat to see from uh, everybody from different areas. Well, I'm from Texas. I'm in shirt. Well, I'm over here by San I'm in between San Antonio and Austin. So, Austin and Braunfels. So, I'm in between. Nice to see you guys. Um... 
how you guys doing? Um, I literally went to a meeting a while back and a lady had COVID. So I was thinking like, oh my God. But thank God I've gotten the shot. But And everybody was fine who was at the meeting. So that's kind of not been a factor. Come here, Cookie. You want to see Cookie? Would you like to see my little dog? Come here, Mama. Maybe there's one that she's eating. Say hi. Hello from Kansas, Diana Smith. I don't know if she wants to even be up here. <laughs> you want to be out the door? Look, everybody wants to see you. No? Say hi. She said, like, can't be alone. No. No face licking. Yuck. I'm sorry. All right, let's get you down. You want to go outside? No, leave me. No, leave me alone, your butt. You want to go outside? All right. How you guys doing? Talk to me. How you been? What are you working on? What you creating? What you designing? This is one of my subscribers' quilts up here. Right here. So it's kind of neat. You guys, some of you are sending me your quilts, and then I get to get to meet you and know you in a different way, which is kind of exciting. Um, so this is kind of neat. Also, I did the block swap. <laughs> you should see me with that dumb block swap. I ended up um, shipping everything, and then I wrote the address on one place. I had to go back home, find the address. So I only had to ship one, and then I shipped that one. Hello, Gleam. I'm sorry if I messed up your name. From Iowa, India, Glean? Galen, Glean? Oh, some of you are shopping. You got, some of you are finishing a chevron quilt. Your granddaughter, Debbie is. I just recently went to a Quilts of Valor uh, meeting. We have like a place where they do quilts of valor, and I think um, I end, we ended up finishing two quilts, and I'm gonna quilt like a couple of quilts for them so that they're not so overloaded with quilting. So that's kind of fun. Um, so I'm doing five or quilting five quilts of valor, but I help participate in quilting three of them or piecing three of them. Okay, so she's okay. So you guys are working on a chevron quilt. I wish it was gonna kind of interactive. Well, that would be Zoom, right? If it was Zoom, then you guys could show me what y'all are doing. <clears throat> You're working on a jelly roll quilt, a race baby quilt. I know some people do jelly quilt races, right? Where you see how fast you could put a jelly roll together because you can really make a quick quilt that way. That's kind of neat. I am, what am I working on? I'm working on the block swap. Oh, I'm working on the block swap. I am making more of these. I love these things. I'm making more of them um, for the, the place where they have the, the Quilts of Valor. I'm gonna make some for them so that we have extras. Oh, you don't quilt just, Christine? Um, thank you for watching anyway. Well, just know that I'm gonna get a laser cutter. When I get that laser cutter, I'm gonna add different stuff to here. Maybe, or have another channel. I don't know. Probably have another channel. Maybe have another channel. Laser cutting channel video. Cause Literally, um, with that channel, or whatever, when I get the laser cutter, I'm starting, it's the same business, it's like me, I'm the business, right? But it's a different type of business, and you're going to see it from the very bottom on up. How I'm learning, how I'm figuring things out, like how I learned on the long arm, how I learned different techniques, and I'm probably going to take a good six months to a year just learning the machine. Melissa is canning food. 
you like gardening I wish uh, I was gardening well I don't consider garden. I was watering my orange tree <laughs> and the snow in Texas killed it hold on let me let mom let me out snow in Texas No, okay, so let's see. Okay, you can't, uh, my guard. Yes, no, I, yeah. Someone is finishing, or Sandra's finishing a triple Irish chain. I hope it's, I wish I could see, like, what y'all are doing, like, See pictures. See how you been. See how you doing. Like see you in person. Maybe I should do a Zoom. Should I do a Zoom? I may do a Zoom. I did a Zoom and there was like five people that joined. Um, and this way I could kind of like see you face to face. See the group. Well, I'm, I'm honestly um, just catching up from work. I am just... I think when... Um, two weeks ago I got like I hurt my shoulder or something and I was really having shoulder and neck problems and so that kind of delayed me but I still finished work and then I ended up having after finally the shoulder and everything got better um, all of a sudden I started having like a stomach virus so that I'm trying to work through having a stomach virus so August was like one of those months where I'm just trying to kind of um, work or work while dealing with like hindrances and um, yeah it's not been fun and so to sit down and just edit a video because I'm filming but I'm not editing let me see someone else, when I look down I'm reading y'all's uh, comments um, we have a South California lady here woohoo um, yes, anything you guys want to ask me, I'm here to, to spend time with you. I feel like sometimes you guys text me or you message me on Messenger on YouTube and I don't get them right away. Like I could get them a week, a week or two later, or it falls in line with a whole bunch of other messages that I don't get them on. Um, hi, 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 Diane from Southern Illinois. I'm not good with names, so that's why I'm like, uh, let me make sure I read it right. Nice to meet you guys um, from all over the world. I ended up um, getting some really neat blocks when we did the block swap. We had um, a variety of people, like from California and from Florida. We had a New Jersey, and then we had, I think, um, Washington State, and then we had... North Carolina, like even Texas, we had New Mexico, so we've, you know, it's kind of neat getting it all over. I'm thinking of doing another one because everybody really had a great time. I just don't know. Um, I kind of want to finish this one, get the quilt top done and get everything kind of finished and then go from there. Um, Okay, Mark from Wesley. Hi, how you doing? Mark, how you been? Um, he's asking me a question. How do I work on wonky quilt tops? Uh, all right, let's see. How can I answer you? Uh, well, first of all, sometimes it's hard to find one, to see if it's wonky. Um, honestly, iron, water, and um, starch starch will help a lot and sometimes mark you are going to have to pleat make like a little fold and i think one of the tricks that i found if you have a wonky or off balance quilt it's um you'll see the pattern or the border angling in a downward direction or angling in a direction and if you see that if you see it before you start, you could kind of like work the fabric up a little bit and you don't have to pleat. But if you catch it too late, 
you can end up having to put a pleat. Also, if you're working on clients' quilts, I recommend you measure the left side, like from top to bottom, and then the right side from top to bottom, and if the numbers are different, you'll know your quilt is wonky. If it's an inch off, it's not that bad. Also, I recommend, I, I used to only measure like the one side, the left side, the top, one side of the top and one side of the bottom. Now I've gotten where I measure both the top and bottom and I measure the right and left. And if I have different numbers, that gives me like the, the knowing that, okay, the quilt is going to be wonky. Because sometimes you'll get a quilt and you don't even notice that it's wonky until it's your, on your long arm. And so you're just going to have to, when you see puddling, to me, a wonky quilt is because it's puddling or they stretched it when they were putting it together. So I recommend you starch it, that you water it, and then you heat it with steam, a hot iron with steam. And I know a lot of people don't like using steam when they iron, but that really does shrink up the fabric on the quilt and they'll take it up and it will unwonky itself. All right, someone else is asking me, let's see. Um, you got three, Diana got three vintage quilt tops. Oh my God, I love quilt top, vintage quilt tops. There was a lady who watches my YouTube and I need to message her back, email her. She wanted to sell me some of her quilt tops and even maybe send them to me and donate them. But um, I think at the time I ended up hurting myself and never got back with her. Let me see, I've always been afraid to... Um, Debbie, honestly, Debbie, I had five people kind of bail <laughs> on the block swap. I just think it depends on the person who's doing the block swap. I am so easygoing. I had one, one lady who, um, uh, well intended, right? Uh, I think she's a new sewer and, um, I'm the kind of person I had five kids. So well, I have five kids. I didn't have them. I had them. I have them. Um, and for me to commit to a lot of things, my commitment was to my children and to take care of them. Right. And so I never did block swaps. I never did quilting retreats. I never, I never did anything cause my life was my children. And so it was kind of crazy last year when I did the block swap, I ran it and it was my first block swap that I ever did. And the people were really great. I think accountability helps you which helps me because so many people are relying on me doing the blocks I'm more committed because I don't want to mess up the people who are waiting but I did have one one lady who watches my YouTube she ended up getting COVID the new COVID the Do COVID Delta and she had two sets she was on two groups and she was so nice by just saying I'm sick I'm sorry and then I found other people that did them for her you know, other people were willing to do them. And then um, I had one lady who was struggling on this last group and I would just kind of ask her if she was okay, if she needed help. And um, in the end, she told me that she just, you know, life happens. I think life happens. And um, so I'm really patient about it or I, I really am an easy patient person about stuff like that because I don't think quilting is that important yeah I mean it is but it's not um in inside of your health or your family or your husband or or your life and so I told her not to worry about it and I went ahead and did them and so I ended up originally just doing one group and the person I did that group for she ended up sick with COVID so I took hers and then I ended up doing two groups. But the blessing is that I'm gonna do two quilt tops. That's like the blessing of it. So sometimes if you can't commit, there's you know, there's other people out there that will do them for you. And since I run them, I take the responsibility. I'm like, I'm running it, so I may end up having to do three of them or a couple of them. There was one, um, a couple people that took them from me and they were getting kind of delayed and I felt like they took it just to help me. So I went over there and I sewed with them for like um, three hours and I helped them finish them. So it just depends. Yes, it is pressure, but 
I don't know. It's a lot of fun. I ended up getting a lot of different blocks. I think some people get mad about block swaps because you don't know what you're getting. You really don't. I ended up getting a, a block that I had to retake apart and fix it because they weren't lined up right. And when I was putting the quilt top together, I had to stretch the blocks a bit because they were a little bit smaller in seams. But I think that's also the fun of it because you don't know what you get. So if you're kind of like easy, easy going and you understand what you're getting into that you don't know if they know how to sew, you don't, it's kind of fun when you see people's take. For example, um, some people thought gray and it's just people, right? Some people thought gray, they almost did a gray black, but that's their version of gray. Some people did gray and it looked like it was almost white and, but it was their version of white. And then some people, um, there was a wonderful lady. She took two block swaps for me. She did a gray color and another one and all her blocks were all different. So every single block she did, everybody got a different one. And going through her blocks was like, like the, it made my day because I, I got to swap them. So it was a lot of fun swapping them because you could see um, one of the rules was like all, let's say if you're doing the white background, but if you have a white background and your color's red, you could put like red dots or polka dots as long as predominantly white. So it was neat when people took their own take on it and just, um, it's going to be a scrappy quilt. And it may not be perfect. And if you're okay with with that process, and but it's neat because when you turn it into a quilt top, people are like, oh, that's my quilt block, or this is mine. When I saw people doing last year's, it was neat seeing my block where people placed it. That's the fun of it. And if you're not too um, kind of overbearing about it, it's fun because you're getting to meet people. Let me read some comments real quick. I saw your YouTube video on easing in the quilt as you're steaming. Yes, Sandra, um, when you're having wonky quilts, literally steaming, um, and this is answering Mark's question again. Sorry, I'm going back. If you hover your steam, so here's your fabric and you hover iron and just push steam on the fabric. Literally, you'll see that fabric just take in. It's beautiful. And what I do, I do that a lot to take in that fabric. We have Doris from Texas. You're from San Antonio, right, Doris? Um, initially, Sandra, when I do a blog swap, I do post it on Loda Ness Quilting Facebook group. I post a picture of the quilt top that we're hoping to make. Um, as a matter of fact, I just recently on Lodena's Quilting Facebook group um, put the PDF of all the blocks and the quilt top together. Um, I'm going to leave it up there for a week and then I'm going to move it to Etsy to see if I can sell my patterns. And let me just say this, I'm not going to sell them for like $10. I'm probably going to sell my patterns for like 3 to $5 just to see if I could get I don't know, a little bit of revenue for the time and the work. But yes, um, the people who were on the Facebook group that wanted to do the block swaps, I ended up posting two pictures of two different quilts of what we could make. And um, last year, someone gave me a suggestion on a block that they liked, um, that they saw made. And I took that suggestion and then I recreated the block on my program. And then I found, I made my own pattern, but it was through a picture. Um, start, uh, Doris asked about starch on a wavy border. L let me say my favorite water, starch, and then a hot iron with steam. It's always the best for any type of wavy border. Yes, uh, wonkiness, wavy borders, um, puddle, you know, like sometimes you'll have blocks that have nipples 
I like to call them nipples, um, or don't, they're doming, to me that looks like nipples, I'm sorry, but they dome a bit, um, someone told me that you could add a little bit of batting into a block that is doming to take up some of that, black, um, that fullness, but I still recommend ironing the heck out of it, watering the, the heck out of it, and steaming the heck out of it, and fabric does take up quite a bit. So, starch on borders, yes, all the time. Um, my go-to batting at this current time, I love warm and natural. I love warm and natural. As a matter of fact, do I have some here? I just recently did a quilt for myself. I quilted it, and I used a white warm and natural. But, let me just say this. Warm and natural is expensive, I feel. And so... Let me see. Hell on. This is what my batting go to batting is. It's a hundred percent cotton. I don't know if you can see that. It is half the price of warm and natural. And um, I did, okay, so this is half the price of Warm and Natural, but it quilts a little, well, it quilts like Warm and Natural. Does that make sense? And let me see. Oh, sorry, I'm out of screen. And look, I want you to see it. This is the Pellon. Um, it's kind of thick. We're talking about batting here. It's kind of thick. Um, I don't know if you see it. It, it, it. It's kind of, it looks, it looks and it's thick like warm and natural. That's why I love it. Um, hold on. I'm doing the live stream. What are you going to do? Nothing. I'm not hungry. Are you happy? Does my daughter, you also want to meet my daughter? <laughs> I love you. Love you. So I love, but the only reason I like this stuff, and it's called, ah, um, because it is like warm and natural. But uh, for my clients' quilt, I think sometimes it's too much to charge them. Um, let me see. Let me answer some of your questions. Okay, so. My batting that I love, 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 is warm and natural. I love the white one and I love the cream one. But because it's so expensive and I have a whole roll of warm and natural. I've bought a whole roll because someone asked me, do I buy rolls? Yes. Um, I try to get it half cost at Joann's with a 50% off coupon. Um, but I found that... If I buy 120 and 120 Pellon, this, if I get it with the coupon, and sometimes Joann's has these 50% off, I could buy 120 by 120 for like less than 20 something dollars, 25 bucks, which it's a lot of batting for a cheaper price. <clears throat> Let me see. So, um, what is your go to batting? It's, po it's cotton, 100% cotton. I'm a cotton girl. Um, I do like wool, so let me explain. Okay, so custom quilts natural, just quilted. I'm gonna quilt this, use this for the rest of my life, be in my bed, play with it, throw it on the floor. Warm and natural, pell on 100% cotton batting. If I am custom quilting, I use um, a warm and natural on the bottom of the quilt, and I also go and use. If it's an expensive wall hanging, like I want to see if I can make an award quilting quilt, I use wool on top, an expensive wool on top for the custom quilting. If I am going to use it as a wall hanging and it's not like for a show, um, I try to use polyester, a thin polyester um, sheet, 
of batting on top of a warm and natural so I can get that beautiful lofting or trapunzo effect. And so those, so I mix for custom quilting, I mix my quilts together, but if it's just for a quilt to use like for my grandkids or for my family, it's just either the Pellon 100% or Warm and Natural. So let me answer some questions. I did my first block swap. Yes, Doris. Um, do I buy battings in a roll? I ended up going to Overstock and got Pellon Warm and Natural. No, no, no. Pellon in a roll. And hold on. Y'all have a minute. Let me go get you a sample. And I was really upset with myself because I got 30 yards for a hundred dollars I thought I was getting a great deal because it was on an overstock and what I was upset about and hold on I'm sorry I left y'all but let me show you I got this at overstock it was a great price I thought I was getting a deal but the batting is so thin if you see it in comparison to how thick this Pellon batting is like you could even if I put it on light now it's great okay this is a great roll of batting. It doesn't stretch on me. It's not the kind where you grab and it pulls on you and it just kind of makes a mess. Um, but I found that <clears throat> it's literally an eighth thick. Uh, well, this is maybe a sixteenth thick and this is maybe an eighth thick. It's a bit thicker. It feels like it's a bit fuller in comparison to um to what i buy in a bag so i did buy rolls i bought two rolls but i found that it was too um too thin and then when i was quilting with it when i bought that roll at overstock.com the i ended up getting uh, bearding in the back of the quilt and that kind of concerns me because if you get bearding in the back of the quilt it could be the fact that your batting is cheap it's cheap batting and um I also think that maybe it was bearding because maybe my needle was old, but I changed the needle and it continued to beard. And so I don't like this, but you know what? The weirdest thing is, is another day I used it another day. I used this and it was perfectly fine, but it's very thin on the quilt. So it doesn't, and here in Texas, since it's so hot, maybe a thin quilt is very, it's okay. <clears throat> but I like, the thicker batting because it thickens the quilt a bit and it's not as flimsy or you know it gives it some body but man warm and natural I just did a quilt with that warm and natural batting and it brought me baby come back not oh I'm, I'm in love with that warm and natural again so I think I'm going to buy a roll of warm and natural to kind of start using it again let's see let me answer some more questions okay let me read um, Doris says to be careful about polyester. It's hard to iron and also be careful with the polyester batting that it is a fire hazard. If a quilt with polyester batting um, gets like lit like a cigarette or there's a fire source, polyester batting like ignites quickly and cotton batting or cotton material doesn't um, light up as quickly so be careful with polyester batting and also be careful doris says to be careful about ironing them let me see how you doing debbie teresa 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 how you doing the um galen told me she's commenting that she got the tova tension tova tension is the best purchase that you could buy if you're a long armor or if you're a sewer because they have Tova tensions for regular sewing machines and Tova tensions for long arm quilting. And there are these little machines that you could use for uh, getting your tension perfect on your sewing machine on the bobbin. 
It is super easy to get your tension right. Yeah, I love it. I check my tension on my Tova tension every time I change the thread on my long arm. That's the first thing I do. Oh, puddling can be bra sizes. Yes, it can. C cups or D cups, it depends. Some people, their blocks puddle. I also think some people um, make blocks without ironing them and then they put it together. So um, yeah, that's a thing. How do I stop skipping tension skips? How do I stop skipping stitches? On Gamel, it has a sensor that if it's not hitting the wheel right, it will jump stitches and it can jump stitches going uh, forward and back and it can skip stitches going um, side to side and it's called a <clears throat> under your wheel of your long arm it has a um, a, uh, a thing that goes around it and it tells the machine the stitches it's like a stitch regulator so be careful with that and then let me see that's the main reason that could be a huge factor for why you're skipping stitches on the gamel there's one on the the side that does forward and back and there's under the gamel there's one underneath what is it called stitch regulator it has also the stitch reg regulator hold on i'm sorry And I don't know if you have a gamel. So if you, I'm only telling you what gamels do because I don't know other machines. Um, if you have, you, we have a rubber seal that you put on the wheel and that rubber seal sometimes starts to flatten. And so you have to buy, it's called like one of these rubber, rubber wheels. You have to put it on the wheel so that um, you stop skipping stitches, but that's what my machine does. So I don't know what your machine is. There's someone from Robin from Ohio. Nice to see you. Um, yes, Jenny says the polyester batting will melt when exposed to flames. And uh, it's really, but uh, Quilts of Valor are very big about polyester batting because polyester batting also doesn't, um, apparently it doesn't mold like cotton batting can. Um, you love the Nova bobbin winder. Oh my God, that bobbin winder. I have one for my regular sewing machine. But yes, the encoder. Yes, the encoder, your seal could be, um, could not be, could kind of flatten and they get old and brittle. Also too, it's not sitting right on the wheel, your encoder. So that's what skips stitches. And you have an encoder under your wheels on that glider thing. And then you have an encoder on the side of your machine on the right side where right where the belts are if you have a computerized system bobbin winder oh my god i was using the gamel bobbin winder and it was the worst that because it came with my machine and um doris was saying your tracks could be dirty you can also um for me the encoder was always the problem for why i was skipping stitches um, the bobbin genies. Oh my God. I love those. I mean, y'all are telling me everybody out everything I told y'all people. <laughs> I love those things I find, and I'm a good person about finding the good stuff. All right, let me see. I didn't know they had an encoder boss or a digital encoder. That's good to know. Um, I don't use the check spring for with my, I mean, I'm just talking about my machine. Um, my long arm quilting machine came with a check spring. I don't use a check spring. What else can skip stitches, cause it to skip stitches? Yeah. Just, to me it was the encoder and also the check spring created long stitches. All right, guys. Um, let me make sure I'm answering and saying hi to everybody. Um, those are Melissa if you have a gamel 
And if you, whatever machine you guys have, I recommend you go to your seller or to the company who you are buying the machine from and um, make sure that they help you. They should be helping you with your machine. And also talk to other long armors. Are you taking the, ho the hook spring? This thing? This little thing my jig. Yeah. How do I decide on a quilt stitch pattern? Uh, Mark, I go to, I have a computerized system, so I go to Ambrite, and I just pick what I like. And when you're quilting for somebody, for a client, for example, this client, uh, um, is, I'm quilting her quilt for her, and she told me to pick what I want. Pick whatever I want, pick whatever design. And it's like a lot of pressure to pick whatever I want because who knows if what I want my client will like. And so I have found, <clears throat> I have really found that people pick fabrics that they love and they like sewing with fabrics that they like, especially if they're going to spend a lot of time on a quilt. And so one of the things that I have found is that, for example, on this quilt, If you look at this quilt, it has a lot of flowers. Um, this quilt also has um, filigree. I don't know if you see like flower filigree. It has flowers here all throughout it. You see a lot of, um, I don't know if you can see it. You can see a lot of roses. So for example, if this, and literally this client is like, you pick whatever. I'm like, okay, pressure. But she spent a lot of time making this, right? And so my, my rule is, if you spend a lot of time making it, you, all, you must have loved this fabric. And so I'm going to get a pattern that is a filigree pattern with roses. And that's how I pick my designs. But I go to Anne Bright and pick my patterns from her. And the reason I like picking my patterns from her is because you could go back years later if you use, if you lose your USB, she will hold the library as long as she has the company, right? So I could go back if I found, if I lost the USB or something happened on my computer. But right now I have these big blocks where they're called passports where I put my designs in. I'll go and I'll go into her. You know, when you buy something and you log in, I'll go in there and download the designs and I don't have to repay for the designs. I like La Ann Bright. One of my also favorites is called Urban Elements. They have some really wonderful digital designs. I think there's, um, and I'm not trying to dog anything. I don't like necessarily DreamWorks. I think DreamWorks quilting designs. Um, well, there's some companies, and this is not them specifically, but some companies, they're really hard to get to download designs. So I'm always like, I got to get things done. I have to be in a hurry. And so Anne Bright has been great. Urban Elements has been great. I think Digitech at one time, if they're still around, um, you could download. And some companies, um, I know... Digitech Digital Quilting Designs. I'm not sure if I'm saying their name right. They'll let you use some of their, they have free patterns. So you can download a free pattern and then put it on your computer and see if it works with your system, which I think that's the best because you can try it out. I know Anne Bright doesn't do that, but sometimes she'll have like such great sales. Oh my God, I lost something. She has such great deals that you're not paying a lot. Um, but what I like about her and Urban Elements is you could go back and re-sign in and you can like re go re-download into a different computer your designs. Um, but I pick designs that one I love that I probably think my other clients will love. Filigree is always great. Whimsy, swirly, moving. 
feathers. Um, Linda's electric, Linda's electric quilting had one of my favorite patterns that everybody loves. It's called, um, meandering feather that in the light, when it hits it, um, to, uh, there's another one. I love flowers and butterflies and also those multi-dimensional designs where one area, one side of the design will create a different design within the design. And so if you're choosing for a client, look at their fabric. That's big. If you, they have a lot of stars in the fabric, pick star fabrics, star digital designs. If like she has a lot of, in this quilt, it's predominantly flowery. It's flowery. It's flowery with filigree. So I'm going to get a flowery filigree quilting design to quilt this quilt for her. <clears throat> <clears throat> let me see. Um, let me see what else everybody else is saying. So that's how I pick digital designs. Um, but Aunt, I like Anne Bright. But Urban Elements does great. Oh, also this. If a design goes up and down like this, be careful with it. Because that means <clears throat> you're going to have to move your quilt down and give yourself space to work it. Those are harder to pay. Harder designs to work. So if the designer who's making the digital designs does like a rectangle design where rectangle fills... Those are the easiest to work, but if the design kind of loops down and comes back up and does a wave, they're hard to work. And um, and I've learned sometimes I've wasted money on a cool design, but translating it from paper to the program, it just didn't work very well, and it was too complicated to work, so I don't even show those to my clients. But... Um, that's how I decide. Get yourself, um, I know Ann Bright had a digital di pr program, monthly program, that was pretty, uh, it's not cheap. No, I wouldn't even do that. I know at one time you can do like monthly digital designs where they would give you like a whole package of them and you could kind of try them out, but then I think they're like $40 now. They went up in price before. They were like $10 to join. I think it was the Platinum Club or the Gold Club or this club. But I recommend that pick initially designs that you like because then when you make your quilts, you'll use them for yourself. And then, um, but if you buy a machine, they should give you some designs. Um, but... I give myself, to be honest, because I have so many designs now, I'll allow myself to purchase 10 designs a year, so I add something different to my library. Um, and a lot of them, let me be honest, filigree flowers, <laughs> filigree with birds, filigree with feathers. But because I found that women tend to like that kind of, or, or paisleys, or butterflies or um, girly type of quilting designs because my clients tend to like those let me see someone says or Jenny says she to clean she cleans her tracks also to stitches your stitches can't skip because of your tracks not being clean so she cleans them with bathroom wipes or baby wipes Cool. Thank you for that tip. Bathroom wipes. Um, the way I choose thread color. Um, Rosalie asked how I choose thread color. Let's see. I love King Tut. I love variegated thread. And. Tr okay. Tip number one. If the quilt has a lot of white. Like this one. For example. I'll probably use a very light toned thread. So I'll probably use a, a light peach, a light pink, a light green, maybe this kind of green, but lighter. And if it has predominantly white, I'll use a light thread. If it's a predominantly dark quilt, I'll use predominantly, meaning you have a lot more dark, 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 dark. 
a lot of this. The I made my person myself a rule. If it's fifty percent, if it's seventy five percent dark, I'll use a dark thread. If it's seventy five percent a light fabrics like lighter tone fabrics, I'll use a light thread. If it's in between, I tend to use. Um, I tend to go either lighter, but I recommend that you lay your thread on top of your fabric across all your colorways and then you'll see sometimes, man, um, I really do believe in listening to your intuition. Like, is that what I'm saying? Um, when I look at, let's say I have this quilt and I'm going through patterns. And I look at the pattern on the computer and I look at the quilt. There's sometimes like a pattern will just say, that's it. Does that make sense? That's the one. This is going to be perfect. The other day I did this beautiful rainbow quilt. It was a scrappy quilt. And I was like, oh, I was, it was a black quilt with scrappy blocks in it, but they had a black background. And I was like, man, what would make um, the quilting pop on this because it was scrappy, but I, um, but I ended up using because it was scrappy and this is the thread color. It's called Joseph's coat. It is a predominant. I don't even know if you can even see it. Probably not. No, you can't. Let me see. Can you see it on this? Probably not. Okay. You probably can't see it, but I'm trying to see if you can see it. Probably not. <laughs> Sorry. I'm trying. Um, Joseph's coat and but they have a brighter richer Joseph's coat I think it's called Nafertiti's King Tut from Superior Thread and I put it on that quilt and that quilt pops the quilting pops but I use a rose filigree design there's sometimes when you're going through a quilt and you're looking at it and you hit a pattern that pattern kind of is like this is what will make it how, bring that quilting out so sometimes it's kind of like that's the hunch and what I do is I'll find three threads that I think will fit that I have a hunch will work and I lay them across the quilt and it just depends what the client wants if she wants the quilting to really pop out you go a little bit richer or darker color if she wants the quilting to kind of be seen but only be seen in the shadowing you go a little bit lighter and so but listen to your hunch I think that's a big one when you're picking designs and you're picking thread colors just listen and then look at their quilt um, I think a lot of us when we're quilting for clients we get to the point like we're in a hurry and we're like just kind of like just get it done I think if you look at the quilt that quilt says something about your client because that person had to love that fabric one to buy it one to sit and piece it and one to take the amount of time that they worked on that quilt they must have loved the design they must have loved the fabric they must have loved something that got them to do it um i don't i as a matter of fact, i did these block swaps recently and um on the block swap where the lady who couldn't do it her her color was green I don't like green fabric I don't like green at all I, I, I like green grass does that make sense it's okay but I don't like green very much so I was like man how am I going to make the blocks pretty that I'm going to enjoy building this blocks with this color and I ended up finding this beautiful green watercolor um, bird with birds in it and I just fell in love with that fabric and then I found fabrics that worked with it and I had so much fun piecing those blocks because of the fabric so I think when you get a client like you know they, they must love something about this they must love the pinks and the pop of red and the, the tones of green. They they must love something. So if you go with what they did and just highlight it, man, your clients will love you. All right, let me see what else someone else said. I love your tones. Tones is my voice. 
<laughs> Thank you, Dawn. Thank you for loving something about me. Um, Thank you for liking my YouTube videos. I really appreciate it. I need to get on the ball. I apologize for not um, posting content on YouTube. Um, <laughs> YouTube is even getting on my case about it. Like, you're not getting as many views as you were. They're like, uh, kind of, you know, like, whatever, shut up. You don't own me. But um, it's just, to get myself to sit and edit a video for six hours, it's kind of like my, I'm having to catch up. So I feel that that's important in taking care of my clients. But I, um, if you, whatever, you're going to end up having, I have a gamel. So some people have a problem balancing their threads with King Tut thread. Um, you are going to get like little pokies no matter what you can't, um, because on the bottom of the thread, it may be green and on the top it may be yellow and you may see like a little hint of green here and there. That's just part of it. But if you're, um, on King Tut on my tension, I use, well, it's either 22 or 220. 223 and then I just fiddle with the tension on the top so what else would you guys like to ask me I'm here to help and just talk to y'all are you guys okay how's life out there my my um life is okay over here what bobbins do I use oh My favorite bobbins are, hold on, hold on, hold on. I do not use the gamma bobbins. Hold on, let me wind this thread. I use an aluminum bobbin. And I love these. If you have tension issues, I bought 100 at Walmart. No, 100 at Amazon for like $30 of these. Will you, will you? Well, you can see that's all of them. I, I love these, but I use aluminum bobbins. I do not use the, the gamma ones. I do not use the ones that have the holes at all. I don't use any of those. And let me share my needles. You wanna see my needles? These are my needles. I don't know if it help. Maybe the needles will help. Um, those are my needles from Gamel or from Superior Thread. I get everything kind of the bobbins I got on Amazon. They're the best bobbins. I like Inova's bobbins. They're red, but they're expensive. These bobbins do the same thing as the Inova's. They're a lighter weight bobbin. They glide easier through the string. And also, too, I use the Bobbin Genies. I, you can also use these on your regular sewing machine. I don't think it's necessary, though. But I, and I, be ever since, let me just, ever since I switched to these and started using this, I stopped having tension issues and the Tova. Uh, I'm sorry, I ended up uns um, picking a whole quilt last week. They suck. You um, I don't even know if I have it. I found a trick on, I want to do a video on a trick I found, but it's not up here. Do I have it up here? I don't have it up here. There's this stuff called the, I, I promise you that these are like um, at Amazon. You can buy them for $30, maybe 50. Okay. For a hundred. I think they were like 30, 20 cents when I got them. And let me just share this. They have this. 
this is open so that you can thread your thread through there and you don't have to have to deal with the thread thing. I love these. Um, I even bought more. And I was trying to use these to lock in my bobbins. Well, I guess they do work. They kind of work. Yeah, they kind of work today. Yesterday they weren't working for me to lock in the thread, but um, I ended up having to unpick a whole quilt top that was a hundred. Um, now was it a hundred? No, it was a hundred and ten by a hundred. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, I ended up having to unpick two rows, which was a living hell. And, um, but you know what I used? It's called, um, uh, Peggy Sue, uh, it, it's Peggy Sue Stitch Eraser. I use it to remove embroidery stitches. Um, and yeah, it works. What you do is, you know how you're, when you're using your, when you're kind of skinning the calf, you pull your top fabric and you, you're, you're like picking the thread underneath or you'll pick the thread, you pull the thread and cut it and you'll pull it um, to unstitch a machine. Well, on the Peggy Stitch Eraser, yeah, I'm sorry, Sandra. I'm, for, I'm sorry. Um, you can literally grind the stitching, the thread from the back. Now the problem is you can over stitch and nick the back fabric. But at that point I was like, hell, I'll replace the back fabric for my client. And, um, and I contacted my client. I'm letting you know, this is what happened, but I'm fixing it. But the best part of that is when I did that, it doesn't touch the top of the fabric. It doesn't, you don't nick the top of the fabric. It didn't even do no harm. And literally I just kind of gathered all that thread mess and cleaned it up and re-ironed the quilt top and fixed it and bought new back fabric for the client and we quilted it what happened is since I wasn't feeling well I put the quilt in the wrong direction so I was quilting a directional design on the wrong direction I, I don't know what the hell's wrong with me and I think it's when I'm not feeling well I'm not paying attention because I'm just trying to finish and do work and um Yes, Doris, I do embroidery, a lot of embroidery. Um, so that, you know, but I learned Peggy Stitch, I want to do a video on it. I should do a video on it, on how I remove the stitching. It removes so fast. Um, it did take me quite a while to unstitch what I did. But, you know, it's just the grind. Don't look at it, just do it. Um, but, Sandra, if you, ha if you could find... A Peggy Stitch Eraser, and they also have at Sally's Hair Salon, they, it's called the Peanut Razor. If you can um, find that, it's the same as the Peggy Stitch Eraser, and it works just the same, and you'll remove all the stitches real quick. I'm not saying real quick, okay, because it's 100 whatever by 100, but you can get a lot of unstitching done quickly with no harm to the quilt top. But you have to be careful. You can nick the back of it. Um, so let me answer some more. Yes, I do embroidery. I do hats, logos, t-shirts, business, and towels. I do everything on embroidery. As a matter of fact, I have three machines now downstairs. Um, one broke. I bought one for replacing it. And then um, I found a guy who fixed it for me. And so I ended up having three. Because I refuse to do embroidery with only one machine. Yeah, don't get frustrated, Sandra. Please take a deep breath, put a good movie on, and just, just, yeah. But I'm sorry. My prayers, I will pray for you. Bob and Genies are these. Uh, someone asked me what Bob and Genies are. Hold on. Let me show you real quick. And just real briefly, because we were talking about this, we can beat a dead horse. Okay. So here's my bobbin. Bobbin genies are these. Which 
You can get these at Amazon and in a quilt store. Magic Bob and Genies. These are the Bob and Genies. This is what they look like. So you can see it. You put a drop of oil. Honestly, Sandra, if you live by me, I'd send you the Peggy Stitch Eraser for you. Oh my gosh. I'll even, I'll even send me your address. Message me. I'll send you as, um, I'll send you uh, my favorite stitcher. Um, this is a bobbin, and I put a drop of oil in here. And then when you drop the oil, I put the Peggy, this, bobbin genie in here. I don't know. Can you see that? And then I put my, so I showed you the bobbin. And then here's my bobbin like that, right? And then I use the Tova. I literally have a video of this, I believe. So if you want to watch it, I think it shares more detail. What I love about this, hold on, is if you pull, I don't know if you can see it, the stitching, the, the as I pull, the needle stays straight. It doesn't do this. This causes bad tension. And, well, it's not even pulling, sorry. The Peggy Stitcher, uh, the Tova, this, it's a washer that kind of lets the bobbin just glide smoothly inside the bobbin and it reduces drag and it also reduces it springing forward and causing issues when you're stopping. I got this, oh, sorry, I ended up getting this idea from Sharon Chamber. She's an award-winning long armor. I love her. That's where I got this idea. And so um, if you look at that red needle, I don't know if you can see it. See how it just stays consistent? And that shows good tension no matter how it pulls. If you have bad tension, which when, sometimes your bobbin winder it won't wind the bobbin right. And also the jump spring that the long arm gamel came with, these came with, it causes that needle to fluctuate. So you'll have good tension and then it'll drag or pull. And so it causes the thread to drag and pull when you're quilting. And I found that these bobbins with this and this to always get your accurate gauge. So when I change it, my gauge is 220 to 205, two, two and a half or whatever or 250, whatever these numbers are. And if you keep that accurate, whatever your number is, keep it accurate with every single thread. Then all you have to do is fiddle with the top tension on your machine. And you don't have to be fiddling. This is always the same with no matter what thread. If I'm using a uh, fine line, if I'm using YLI, if I'm using any other kind of thread, this tension gauge stays the same. Um, but that's these, that's what Bob and Genies are. They're like, it's like a jump ring, but it's a polyester. It just glides through there. So I hope I answered you, Debbie. Um, let me see what else someone, what is my maintenance routine? Mark asked, I try to clean my machine, like really clean my machine, take off the bobbin. I oil my machine every time I start. I oil, um, every time I start my machine, the beginning of the day, I oil all my oil ports, always. Um, every time I change the bobbin, I change this bobbin, I oil the bobbin, and I clean the bobbin. Inside the bobbin section, I um, slough it off with a brush, and I always oil the the bobbin area where the bobbin sits in. I just, that's just a habit. I oil that. But all my oil ports, I oil in the beginning of the, of my, my work day. Um, I know Gamel is an oil machine, but it's like a car. You need to oil it. Um, then Gamel requires like a, where you oil all your ports and it goes through a run through where it kind of like the, all the parts run and they tries to oil all the areas, all the bearings that are within the machine. I clean my machine once a month, meaning 
I, um, of course I dust it daily, but I'll go through all my belts. I'll go through all, like I'll take that bobbin case thing out. I'll make sure there's no thread caught up in there and clean that. And then I clean my, where the wheels are. I clean my wheels. I'll take my gamel, the, the machine off the wheel things and flip it because thread gets caught up in there when you're working. I'll also clean all the areas where I have my um, my hookers. <laughs> I'm going to say it right. Where it grabs it, I, I get a brush and just brush all the, um, the Velcro and get all the dust off of it. I'll clean everything, but I'll do that maintenance process once a month. But I oil my machine every time I use it in the beginning of the work day and I oil this every time I change the bobbin um, but that's my process um, what else do I do of course I clean um, the area up after I work every time I'm finished working I clean up my workstation I put everything away I am I can't work in chaos and I'm a control freak at heart I think so if the ho this place could be a disaster but by the time I leave even if I'm completely exhausted everything will be put away and cleaned up so that when I come up here the next day I'm starting a new day um, so that's kind of like my maintenance process I go through literally I'll take everything off and I'm very mechanical I used to work on cars so I'll take everything apart meaning I'll take a face plate off if I need to and get all the dirt and grime in there and then I'll re-oil everything um, I've taken my long arm apart so that really helped me know better know more about my machine in a way I would have never known if I wouldn't have done that and so some of the belts they end up having threads stuck in them so I take the face plates off and take the belts off and if I see any grime and dirt I clean it out clean it out but that's probably once every six months and then you can literally clean your motor on Gamel's motor you can clean it I have videos on where you can take the nuts out and I think it they're called these motor things and you can spray clean them and get all the dust and gunk out of them and I do that once a year so I try to do like regular maintenance and dusting and cleaning like that once a month but the major stuff every six months or every year where I'm cleaning the motor and I'm cleaning like the weird the crazy stuff so let's see what else you guys asking me hi Marie from Oregon I hope I'm saying from sunny Oregon nice to see you nice to meet you um let me see Oh, thank you, Marie. Thank you for admiring my videos. Um, I appreciate you guys watching me. It's really a gift. I really didn't think YouTube was going to be anything. <laughs> I really just started doing videos to do videos for classes that I used to do at my church. Let's see. Yes. Uh, what is the difference between plastic and Teflon bobbin genies? I didn't know they sold different Bob and Genies. Um, I use the Teflon ones. I don't know. Um, Sharon Shamber talked about these, and that's why I got them. <laughs> I felt like, hey, if an award winner is suggesting something to me, you better take it up on her. Um, so, but I know minor Teflon. I don't know. I've never tried the other ones. I've never tried the plastic. I think Teflon is smoother and it glides better. And let me just say this. They're not that expensive. They're $13. But this is my first bag that I bought. These suckers, um, I think Teflon is more durable and they don't bend. But let me just say this. These last forever the only problem is is if you bend them like if you bend them and warp them 
then they're not as smooth. I don't know if you could see how like smooth they are. So yeah, let's see, let's see. But I get the Teflon ones. I just do what Sharon Shamber says. That that's that's it. But I don't know. I've never tried the plastic. And I probably never will because these work perfect. Um, they say these are really good for L bobbins. These are L bobbins and for the gamels or long arms, the M bobbins. I tried these with my embroidery machines. I really didn't like them. And the reason is, is I use a paper bobbin, um, a pre-wound paper bobbin. And almost that paper is like one of these. So it's almost like doubling up on it and I was having trouble with the tension and I really didn't need it. But you can use them for your regular sewing machine. Um, so what are you guys doing for tomorrow? Isn't it a holiday tomorrow? Okay, someone wants me to show the bobbin tension. This is a Tova bo uh, bobbin. Well, I'm sorry mine okay so let me bring it to you here my tension is at there's a 200 right there right here do you see that right there the number mine's 200 to 220 250 so if you see it if I can get this right I'm having to think different So you get it like this and then you pull. Do you see how my bobbin is not shifting up and down? And it stays consistent. Um, the It's called the Peggy Stu, Sue Stitch Eraser. Peggy Stitch. If you, I even have a video on it. It's called the Peggy Sue Stitch Eraser embroidery eraser and just put Peggy Sue stitch eraser and put Lorena and you'll see my video. I did a video on it because I use it to remove embroidery stitches. It saves me on embroidery stitches. Um, Cause sometimes embroidery is a lot more finickier than the long arm. It's rare when the long arm kind of skips and kind of like jumps off. Sometimes with an embroidery machine, the hoop hits something and it redirects the stitching and it messes up. So I end up unstitching more on embroidery than I do, of course. Well, I do on long arm quilting, but not like I do on embroidery. So it's called the Peggy Stitch, Stitch Eraser. I wish I had one. I have one downstairs, but I don't want to just, let me, I'll be back. See you in 10 minutes. Oh, no, it won't be 10 minutes. But um, yeah, I ordered, I was sharing last time on the live feed that I ordered a laser and um i found out that it's going to be a bit delayed but i'm still excited about it well i mean hopefully it's not gonna be delayed but it's on its way it's on its way from china apparently can you imagine we're getting stuff from china so i'm excited about that because i'm excited to make um rulers long arm quilting tables that i could put on i don't know i'm i'm gonna see I got it written down. Okay, Miss Sandra. There's also, Sandra, uh, there is a, it's called a, um, hold on, let me show you a picture. Peggy Stu, yes, they're expensive. Go, but if you go to Sally's Hair Salon, I would get a Peggy Stitch Eraser. The Peggy Stitch Eraser and the Peanut are the same, and they're like $45. As a matter of fact, I, I filmed a video on do they both work, and they both worked. It's just, I noticed with the peanut, um, the eraser, well, of course it was newer, the blade was newer, so I had a little bit more of a learning curve with it, but it worked. Let me get you, hold on, let me show you this. And if you go to Tooltron, these are called mini seam rippers. Love these. I love these things. I have videos where I talk about these things. They're only like a dollar seventy. 
I love Tiltron. I end up buying like 20 of them and I give them to quilters and they look at me like I'm a loser. Like, really? You're giving us this? And I'm like, yes. And then a week or two or a month later, I come back and they're like, where'd you get that ripper? Where did you? And I'm like, yeah, I told you I found you a good thing. But these are from Tooltron, the mini, mini rippers or mini seam rippers, Tooltron.com. Yes. And, uh, um, yes, but you may, Sandra, you, you may end up losing the back fabric, but I felt like it was worth it. I literally, um, was, and it literally dissolves a thread to where on the back, on the front, it just pulls off like the thread completely pulls off. Um, let me see. Someone asked me if I watch Jamie Wallen. Yes, I do. I used to, I don't know more. Um, yeah, I love his rollers. He, you know, I met him at Houston quilt show that Houston at the Houston, um, quilt show and I bought his rollers. Yes. But I don't take a lot of classes, um, from a lot of people or watch a lot of people. I think what's hard about YouTube is you don't, people can, um, when you watch people, you kind of receive what they give you, right? And I'm the kind of person, if you have an accent, I'll start talking your accent. If you have a kind of slang, I'll probably mimic your slang. I'm a bit of a mimicker, I think, sometimes. And so I don't want, I love Jamie Wallen and all these beautiful long armors. I don't want to um, imitate them because I want to be my authentic self and do my authentic kind of work. And I think if I don't watch other piecers or long armors or other creators in my field, then I'm not influenced because I've noticed, and um, I'm not trying to say anything, when one influencer would post, for example, they were making these tree quilts. All of a sudden, other piecers were making tree quilts because this person's tree quilt was getting a lot of views. So almost like you're kind of shutting in everybody to where they're only gonna watch tree quilts because the motivation for the content creator is to get the viewership that this other content creator is getting. So let me copy them so that when they post the video, my video is gonna pop up. You may like this one too. And I think, um, I don't want to be an, um, I don't want to be a person who copies someone else because I really have a lot of respect, like for, for Sharon Shamber, man, her, I'll watch no matter what, but there's no way I can ever mimic or recreate what she does because she's so wonderful. And so some like Jamie Wallen or, there's a couple beautiful long armors. I don't watch their content because I don't want to like try to even unconsciously recreate what they're doing. So I feel like if I don't watch anybody, whatever I do, it's just mine <laughs> because I thought of it and it was in my brain and no one showed me the idea. It just came out. So yes, I do watch Jamie Wallen, but since I started making my own YouTube channel, I've kind of walked away from watching quilting videos or long arm videos or even piecing videos so that when I show something it's totally different than what my community is doing that's what I'm trying to do not not that it may not be working but that's what I'm trying to do so let me see there's someone from Canada woohoo Canada I love you Canadians you're wonderful people and uh, let me see Debbie, if you want an embroidery machine, I remember I recommend that you get a six needle um, brother baby lock embroidery machine. They're cheap to fix. And honestly, very rarely are you gonna use more than six thread colors. You're more likely gonna use three or four. And so I know Melco has those um, huge embroidery machines you're not going to need that if you're going to want to do an embroidery business i started my business just with one embroidery machine 
and I started making quite a bit, a decent amount of income working for youth associations just with one machine. So you don't have to go big to start. Um, let me see. Um, you're new to quilting, Iman? Iman? You're new to quilting. Um, I ended up going to a guild and I love this guild. And I think what's hard about guilds, um, if I recommend guilds, um, what's hard about guilds is they could be very cliquish. And when I was a new sewer or a new maker or a new quilt top maker or even new long armor, to be honest, new long armor, I was going to um, like a long arm guild. And what happens is you have the established group, you know, the <clears throat> the fufui people, the people that I could be considered the fufui group now, the the talented, the know-it-alls, the ones that have been in it forever, those people. Um, what happens with that kind of community is the greats. I'm not saying that I was one of, I'm one of the greats, but what happens in that kind of community is that they kind of exclude the newbies and they hurt the newbies. And it's sad to say that that's what I saw with this quilt guild that I went to. I was a newcomer and I was even shunned or excluded or looked down upon by the greats, the, the, the ones that know. But because I've been doing this so long, it was like, whatever, I'm talented. You just don't know, you know? I feel like I was a hidden gem. And I think when I did my trunk show at this quilt guild is when they started kind of like having a different respect for me and seeing me in a different light. But I think if you're a new sewer, I recommend um, Iman that you teach people like that you love, like your friends, and that you get you create like your own little sewing bee of sewers and you kind of connect with someone that likes sewing like you and that you go to like little events together so that you both learn together and you both encourage each other because if you go to the quilt guild you may get hurt i just i love this guild and i got hurt by the guild i didn't get hurt i just got tired of it I, I got tired of the, the stupidity of it. And I was just like, I don't need to do this. I'm wasting my time here. But in that, I met some really wonderful beginning sewers and some people that were excluded, the shunned. And um, I kind of took them in and loved on them. And now I have like a sewing bee that I'm creating and a sewing group that I'm being a part of because I am the kind of person like there was no long arming in YouTube ever when I was here when I first started and I didn't have no one who was in long arming wanted to teach me nothing and if they wanted to teach me they wanted to charge me up the butt for it so I felt like first of all I didn't have the business and I didn't have the money and so um it's you kind of just and I went to some long arm groups and there were the custom quilting long arm group that's you know you're only a long arm if you're a custom quilter you're nobody and after a while I was just like I don't need to deal with this crap so I was I'm alone I was a very much a loner and um everything I learned was by myself and then I would look at long arm quilting on YouTube at this current time you either have to have written a book, kind of be famous, um, for to share, and the the motives is buy my stuff so I could share. And so I was like, man, you know what? Maybe I should do YouTube. And and I literally from the beginning it's like let me let me learn because I didn't know what I was doing. Maybe doing YouTube was going to push me to try harder, even though I was failing severely. And even when you see my videos of where I'm quilting and I'm quilting really pretty, I'm still trying to learn. Um, I remember paying Linda's Electric Quilting for classes and spending like $300 for being a club member 
to learn and then after a while that got boring so my recommendation I don't recommend you going to a guild unless you are really thick-skinned um, initially I recommend that you get a couple friends um, that that you know that like sewing and start making your little group so that you could pick each other's brains and if you do go to a guild don't take it personal some people are just rude and women are stuck up rude people sometimes and so if you're okay with that and you're not going to take it personal and if you go with the friend i think that would be nice i love my guild because um for, for the bad part is i was part of the in group right um <laughs> But the bad part is, is because you're part of the in-group, the in-group expects you to only stay with the in-group and not talk to anybody else, kind of. And I was kind of like, I want to talk to everybody. And some of the people in the in-group purposely didn't talk to people just because they didn't want to. They didn't want to be bothered. And they didn't want to be bothered by me because you haven't been here long enough, even though you're in the in-group, which is stupid. So... I just decided to leave because I found some really wonderful people that don't know how to sew but want to. Um, they don't know, they don't have the perfect piecing, but God, they love sewing. And so I started doing a sewing bee at my house and I started doing a, I'm going to start doing a, an event every once a month on one of the Fridays. And I also involve myself with a, it's called Quilts of Valor. If you get in a quilt group where it's a service group, like you're quilting to make stuff and serve, I recommend those, like a Quilt of Valor group, because the people who are usually running Quilts of Valor have a different heart than the people who are in quilt guilds. A lot of people who are in quilt guilds, I'm sorry, I'm like just throwing my quilt guilds in, in, in the under the bus they're very much let me show you what I created and I have a quilt community or quilt guild community who could see my extraordinary art and you're here to watch what I do but when you go to a quilts of valor group those people want to make quilts for military members or they want to make quilts for orphan children like groups like that that quilts that want people who want to make quilts for orphan children People who want to make quilts for military members, people who want to make quilts for like to serve. So you're going to go there, they're going to teach you how to piece certain things and you're going to make something and create something to be donated. Those are the kind of people you really want to tap into because they have a buttload of information for you, but they want to use you to create something because they want to and like make quilts and um that's what i left the quilt guild and that's what i'm doing now so i'm part of the quilts of valor and um it's growing which is kind of fun a lot of people are coming and it's a lot of fun and there's a lot of joy in the group everybody's very accepting because nobody knows anything other than the lady who runs it and um you're making a quilt to be given to a service member. So that's what I recommend for you because quilt guilds can hurt you because I know when I went to quilt guilds and long arm guilds, long arm things, um, I really was like discouraged and I felt like I came back wounded and it kind of like hurt the love of what I was creating. So, but that's my recommendation. Um, teach one of your best friends what you're doing and share it and be enthusiastic and someone will be a part of it. And I end up like, uh, I'm not going to the quilt guild. It's my first time and I feel kind of like discouraged about it, but I'm going to invite like a couple of my friends and we're going to have our own quilting in my house and we're going to have our own shindig and we're going to probably do something crazy and weird like paper piece butterflies and try something and 
kind of just enjoy people that are like you that um so find people that are like you and i want to encourage you there are out they are out there but sometimes at a quilt guild they're hard to find because uh when i went to the retreat the new braunfels quilt guild retreat that was the worst experience of my life i wish i never paid 350 dollars to go to a retreat because people in that guild and i'm sorry lord have mercy they purposely went out of their way to ignore me and I've never felt that experience where someone is purposely ignoring me because they think they're better than I am and in the end the, the people that were ignoring me finally talked to me and when they found out that I had a YouTube channel and when they found out that I was a long armor they were kind of like oh you're somebody and I was just kind of like, Ugh. four days of you purposely giving me your back. I don't know. It does something to your heart. I left there like, dang, I could have rented a hotel with my best friends and had more fun. So just be careful. Um, and just be careful. There is a community out there for all of us. Um, that's why I love the block swap. And even when things don't go right in the block swap, I'm not, I don't feel like I'm not going to say anything ugly. I'm not going to get mad about someone not doing it. I just want to have fun and enjoy it. And I want to be that person for others. But, and if you can't find it, then you could be the one that makes it. So there's my, my, oh, I'm sorry, guild tangent. Forgive me. Um, let me see. Yeah, it's hard when you're a new baby quilter or piecer to walk into a place and not have any confidence. I didn't even, pat knowing patterns or anything, and people sometimes just don't want to share. But um, the, you, the neat thing is, is you have a YouTube community, and there's some wonderful people out here on YouTube that are sharing your piecing. They're sharing patterns with you. They're sharing long arm quilting with you and take advantage of that. When I started, there was none of this. There was nothing. I literally struggled. As a matter of fact, when I was seeing quilts the way I saw them, I was like, is this normal or is it just me not knowing my job? And so I just want to just think there, there, um, my best friend doesn't know how to sew and, and I'm forced, I, you're coming with me. <laughs> Even if you just sit in front of the sewing machine and cackle with me and talk to me, I took her to the retreat with me. And honestly, if I would have gotten to that retreat by myself, I think I would have just been in the hotel room crying and just like, I want to go home. But I had my best friend with me and me and her just kind of cackled and had fun and just moved on our day and ignored the people that ignored us. So, um, yeah, but there's... There's some good people out there and ask God to bring him to you. I told the Lord, why, Lord, am I around these people that don't, why am I around these people? And then there was another group of people that weren't seen. And I was like, those are my people. You know, they want to learn. They're hungry. They're funny. They're goofy. And those are the people I just, I want to be around. Yeah, long armors will shun you. Yes. Yes. Nana says that long armor is under. I'm sorry. Yeah, me too. And and it's okay. I think it's a blessing because whatever you get is yours. Whatever you've learned, you've earned. Um, the skill that you got, it's your. And no one you no one can take credit for what you and God gave you to get. And I think. No one can say, well, I taught Lorena. Lorena knows everything because I taught her. She, no one can take credit for who I am and what I've done. No one can take credit for my business, for nothing. And so sometimes being shunned is a blessing because if you're resourceful and if you, st if you want it and you're hungry, you'll get it. You'll get it. You have time to get everything. You have time to learn about 
scant seam allowances. You have time to learn about, you know, bias. I didn't know what bias was. Like, what's bias? <laughs> I hate bindings still, but I'm learning different tricks of binding. So um, I always thought in my 20s that I had to hurry up and learn everything because I didn't have time. And now I'm 50 and I'm realizing, I'm not 50 exactly yet, but I'm going into my 50s. I'm like, you know what, God, you gave me time to learn what I needed to learn. And and if I don't learn it, um, it's okay. <laughs> I'll be okay. So let me see. Let me read some more. Um, they are... Yes, there's clicks in everything. There's even clicks on YouTube. Um, yeah, there's clicks on YouTube. And um, YouTube is very clickish. There's a couple people that um, are doing what I'm doing. And that's why I don't do... What is it called? Um, I don't do collaborations with other people. I don't do... What is it... Um, where you, I do a video and someone else does a video and we collab together to try to get the YouTube subscribers to join each other's group. I don't care. Like, I am not that desperate to be known. I, I feel like I was a little gem long arming by myself in my house and I was a little gem long um, piecing in my house and me and God were doing it and we had a lot of peace and we had no troubles and no problems. And I'm a little gem on the YouTube community where no one sees me, but the people that need to see me, see me. And, and I honestly, the people on my Facebook group are so wonderful. There's no cattiness, there's no ugliness and people do come on there and they start trying to micromanage me and tell me what I should do and tell me what I should not do and I just click them off because I care less because it's, it, uh, <laughs> I don't care you know what I mean it, not that I don't care I don't care what people think I should be because I'm going to be who I want to be and I'm moving on you know what I mean I'm moving on and I'm moving forward with myself If I don't know if that makes sense to any of y'all let me see yeah. yes Someone said something to me, and I like what she said. She was part of the guild, and I love this lady. She says, if it's, not, if it's not your family or kids or your husband, it's not that important. And I was like, hmm, yeah, you're so right. And I, I think, too, um, you could become... What I learned, I learned on my own, and it's, I think it's unique. It's kind of different. It's not what's out there. And I think if you only learn, if you're learning by from someone else, uh, for example, uh, what is her name? I love her quilting. Um, she wrote a book and she at Green Fairy Quilting. Maddie, Mad, Jamie Madison, Jamie Madison. I love her quilting. I love her stuff. It is so unique. I know she's self-taught. No one taught her. She does a lot of ruler work her she has beautiful lines in her quilting it's just right but she wrote a book and it, and people want to learn what she does so I remember going to um, I think two quilt shows one in San Antonio and one in New Braunfels and I saw so many people quilting from her book so their quilts look exactly like her book quilts and I was like it's great that you're learning from somebody, but I feel like you want to learn their skill or you're going to want to learn versions of what they have to teach you, but you don't want to recreate the same exact replica of what they did because you want to put your own spin in it. And so I think like Jamie Madison, I have her books. I love her books and I've learned from her. But I've never honestly ever tried to make one of her quilts because um, it's already been done. I, I feel like I want to grab something from what she has to offer. Um, and she does a lot of marking. She does a lot of measuring. Um, and she does a lot of like border work, which I love that border work. But no way am I going to be doing that everywhere because that's not my style. I want to maintain my style. 
And so you don't want to necessarily just copy someone that you want to grab parts of them, I guess, of what they have to share. I'm reading. I'm sorry if I pause. Uh, Mark was asking me if clients can download. Yes, Mark, they can download the pattern. They can pay for it and put it on a USB and then you put it on your computer and use that pattern they purchased. The only thing is, is if they purchased it, you have no rights to keep it. But yeah, um, I have my clients tell me what designs they want because they go on the sites and they say, I love this and I love this and I love this. And then if I have it, um, I'll use what I have because I have a lot of library in my pattern. I have a lot of patterns in my library. And so if I don't have it, I'll buy it. I'll buy it. And then that pattern, if I like it, and I pick the pattern I like the best because I'll give them an option of three, um, I will use that pattern with other clients. But you can have your clients buy their own patterns. And that's up to your client to decide, though. Or you could tell your clients, you have to use the library I have. Um, I've gotten to the point I'll buy, like I said, I have 10 patterns a year. So, you know, 10 clients here and there can pick a pattern and I'm going to buy it. But I'll give an option of three that they could choose from and I'll pick the best one. And because I know that the best one is I'm going to use for other clients. Um, I'm reading Sandra's comment. Okay, I'm reading someone's comment. I don't. <laughs> no one needs me. <laughs> Y'all are funny. Um, honestly, I asked the Holy Spirit to show me. When I had that quilt that it waved out, I wanted to panic. I was like, oh my God. And I was like, okay, calm down. Just start praying, girl. Just ask Jesus to help you. <laughs> like to help ask for wisdom, revelation, understanding. And all of a sudden it was like wet the bottom of the quilt and start stretching it. And I was like, oh my God. And I started doing it and it worked. So ask God for help. He's here. Um, let me see. Someone was asking me, I'm currently piecing a quilt that I saw in a magazine. It took me three. Four. Yeah, it's okay. Um, Sandra, if it takes you time to figure it out, I know learning by yourself takes longer. Yeah, I know. It's okay. I know. <laughs> I did the block swap and I ended up uh, messing it up. And I was like, what am I doing wrong? I did four of them. What am I doing wrong? And it was that seam allowance was off. And I, I learned something though, that when you have a lot of seams, and your allowance is wrong, you end up losing, that it shrinks in. Wow, what a wonder, what a way to learn that. And the block swap was a big factor on that. And then I learned to look in the back of the quilt or top to see if the seam allowance was right. But I learned it, you know what I mean? I learned, now I got it. I got a lesson that, I think when you have problems, okay, <sighs> I have a bad attitude sometimes when things don't go right. But when I've learned, when I have a problem, for example, I'm gonna do a video that's coming, okay? I ended up quilting it and I have a pleat in the back of it. I ended up having a pleat in the back of it. I pulled it, I pulled the back of the quilt back. I did pull it and I pulled it really taut. But somehow, I think what's happening for me, cause this happened three times just recently. <laughs> <laughs> either the fat the back fabric is folded and it's a uh, fabric has a memory so when it's folded it's kind of pleating in so I'm not pulling it enough and so what I'm realizing is one maybe I need to start ironing the back fabric maybe to make sure it's completely straight or I need to use more clamps to pull it so I ended up having a quilt top that in the back when I rolled it the first time I didn't see the pleat so how somehow it pleated on the bottom end of that row and then because it pleated on the bottom end the first row it pleated in the second row 
And when I rolled the second roll, so excited, like, I'm row two done. There was a pleat right in the middle, and I wanted to cry. But you know what I learned? I unstitched that center area. I unstitched it. I don't want to ruin it. And I wet the heck out of that back fabric, and I ironed it, and I took in that pleat that I made a mistake of putting, and then I went back and quilted it. That mistake taught me how to fix something that I would, when I was younger in long arm quilting, wouldn't have thought I would be able to fix. So mistakes really teach you how to fix th fix things, um, and it, you really learn when you fail. You really do learn how to not fail once you fail that way. And so when I used to have bad tension, I really learned like find different bobbins, get that toe in tension, try that check spring. And because of those, so some of the things I'm sharing so easily and successfully with y'all came through major failage major failage and um so and so I, I had a comment just recently when i did that quilt top that had that buckling on the very bottom row and the person's like what kind of video is this that you're just what what the hell who would waste this kind of time showing this and i commented me me because in my failure i'm sharing with you how I fixed it because if you're a quilter or a sewer or you're a quilt top maker you're putting your long armor through this and two I'm also trying to share with a long armor this is how I fixed it maybe your problem is going to be different but you can fix with quilting and piecing and any fabric work t-shirts clothing garmentry you sewing you can fix it you could unstitch and restitch you could cut down, you could trim, you could take in. With with sewing, you could fix stuff. So I know it sucks, but I've learned, like that Peggy Sue's stitch eraser with that 110 and by 100 quilt that I had to unstitch, I never knew that this, I always thought this was the only way to unstitch a quilt this way. Like, da, 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 da. I was unstitching it and I wanted to cry. <laughs> I was like, and I unstitched like a 12 by 12 square and it took me an hour and I wanted to die and cry and just fall apart. And then I, I said, Lord, how am I going to fix this? I, I'm i going to be here for four days. No, and I'm not talking four days, like an hour a day, like four days, eight to 12 hours a day doing tick, 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 tick. <laughs> and um, I heard, I, I remembered in my brain, I remembered the Peggy Stitch Eraser. And I was like, I wonder if that thing would work on the back of the fabric. I wonder if it would work. And oh my God, I was like, eh, 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 eh. I could do a 12 inch square in less than 10, 15 minutes. And I, if I didn't have that failure, I would have never had what I call it, that victory in figuring out how to fix that problem. And so I hated it when it happened. And be honest, I hated it when it happened, but I'm so glad it happened because I'm going to make a video out of it. <laughs> and I was, emb I'm embarrassed that Lorena, the idiot, put it, the quilt top in the wrong direction. It's embarrassing because I should know better, but my head, my neck was hurting. I had a migraine. I wasn't feeling well, and I just wanted to get a job done. And in that kind of condition, I wasn't paying. I wasn't alert. And so another lesson is don't work like that. Take the day off. But no, I wanted to do it. So don't look at failure in a bad light, I guess I want you to be encouraged and see it differently because you're learning something. Yeah. Um, oh, and put some good movies on. Man, when you're unstitching, I, I, I unstitched through the night till four in the morning, woke up at eight because the client dropped off a quilt. 
then worked on some quilts, came back and worked from four to like four in the morning the next day. And then I, I worked on it all Saturday. I was a broken human being by the time I was done. And then I quilted the quilts. <laughs> I quilt, I was broken. I was broken. I was like, maybe I should never do this ever again. But man, that Peggy stitch eraser, my husband's like, how long are you going to do that? And I, I, I said, until I finish. Uh, and let me just share this. There was a military guy who, he went to the Marines. And um, I said, what? And I like talking to people who do crazy or in different. He goes, yeah, I was in the Marines for 10 years. And I said, what did you learn? What was the lesson you learned? I asked him. And he says, the lesson I learned is I could do anything. And I said, how did you learn that lesson? And he says, I remember my well, lieutenant, sergeant, whatever, would tell me to climb up a mountain with a backpack that had 100 pounds on it on my shoulder. And it was like 110 degrees in the Sierra Desert. I don't, like, that's kind of what he told me, right? He goes, and I would look at it and say, I can't do it. No way, I can't. He goes, when I started, the the words he spoke to his spirit was, I can't, no way. How am I, ne that's not... And, and then he says, but then we started and we went and he says, and I ended up on that mountain with a hundred pounds. And he says, what I learned through every time I told myself I can't, he figured out that he could. And so from that moment on, he says, when I would see something that was an adversity or a problem, he said, I can do it. Just don't look at it. So when I'm unstitching that quilt, and I'm seeing like it's all the way across, <laughs> like 110, all the way across that I have to, and it's like 18 inches wide. And I did three rows like that. And I'm like, and I and I, I was like, if that military guy with a backpack on his back had 150 pounds on his back, I don't know, right? He's running in the Sahara Desert, running up a mountain. If he says, don't look at it, Lorena, don't look at it. And so I was unstitching and my hands would get tired. And then I'm like, I would see you. I've, I'm only done this much. Don't look at it. And you know what? If I didn't look at it and just did it, I got to it. I got to it. I At four o'clock or six o'clock in the morning one night on a Saturday night, I literally, I said, the day of heaven for me is the day I pull this apart and it's loosened from itself from the three layers. And I said, that's going to be a day. And when I pulled that thing apart at 6 a.m. in the morning, I was like, because I told myself, you're not going to stop till you're done. Because Sunday, you're not going to have that in your hand. And you know what? Um, I got up at 10 o'clock the next morning to do service. I had a couple hours late. But you know what? I had the victory that day because that quilt top was off the batting and it was off the back. And... You know, hey, it was great. It, it was a great day. But that military guy told me, just don't look at it. Just do it. So I've had to learn, even at that moment, how to do that. Let me see. What are you guys saying to me? Uh, first comment. I love the way you fix things. This is from Tan Tangle Zest. Nice to meet ya. Thank you for keep watching me. <laughs> Two full days, eight hours plus listening. And yes, Sandra, don't look at it, Sandra. I'm your biggest cheerleader. We're, we're, we're quilt on stitchers. We're cheering you on, girl. I'm cheering you on. <laughs> Just know <laughs> you're not the only one. <laughs> and I'm on YouTube. I should know better. But it happens to the best of us, man. Oh, my goodness. Um, thank you for watching my How to Fix videos. Thank you for watching. I really appreciate you guys watching. Just taking time of your life to watch me be, I don't know, the. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, there's overabundance of how you should do things correctly. I need a fellow. What just happened? What, um,. I don't know that question. Okay, Michelle asked, thank you. There are overabundant of how many videos you should do a thing correctly. I need fellow 
just happened. Now what do I do? <laughs> uh, yeah, this just happened. Now what do I do to fix it? Um, I in there's a lot of people that are there to teach you. Grab a hold of the teachers that make your life the easiest. Um, and just because a professional said to do it this way, you may have a better way. Uh, for example, you know, in quilting, I hate binding and I did that rollover binding, binding without binding because I didn't know how to put binding on and I didn't know how to stitch binding. I mean, and so I was like, how can I bind this thing and get it done without doing binding? And so I was like, huh, maybe I can use a back fabric and flip it over. And somehow I found a trick. I found the trick. And that video has made me, a, you know, a lot of views because there's not a uh, YouTube community of saying, just in case you don't know, this is how you could do it differently. But do what fits you. Um, as a matter of fact, Gamel has you put three, three liters on a quilt. They have you put a liter on the quilt top. Um, I couldn't do it well. It didn't work for me. And because Gamel said, and my quilt tops were being warped and it just didn't work. And so I asked this lady, how can I do it differently? And she says, well, try this way. And that way was the fastest, the easiest, the most convenient way. And, but that's what worked for me. I know I sew my leaders. Like I just sew a basting stitch on my leaders and I number my leaders. There's so many people that use the, um, that pin. Ugh. And there's so many people that use the red snappers. I don't like the red snappers cause they hurt your hands. And I think it's weird to align. Um, it's weird to align the fabric exactly the way it needs to be aligned. It's just, um, it's a lot of like maneuvering on the bar and the fabric falling and the you're pushing that red snapper in. And, and I know probably it's the learning curve, right? On me figuring it out. But for me, sitting down, doing a basting stitch and and I know that that back fabric is so nice and straight. It was perfect for me. It just made sense for me. And so when you're learning somebody's skill or way um, just grab what's, what's good for you. You don't have to do it their way, but grab what's, uh, what works for you. As a matter of fact, connecting my binding, I, I watched one lady do it one way. It was such a different way. And I said, you know what? Um, I could do that way, but different. And so what I did, and I kind of did her way, but I added glue. And adding that glue to adding your connecting seams to your binding literally helped me when sewing it that that tail end together to finish the binding. Um, that's how I got that trick. But you don't have to grab what everybody's showing you. And just because they say they're professional doesn't mean it's what's your fit. Like, um, not all clothing fits us the same. You know, I could be a size 10 and we're all size 10, but you're a size 10 with long legs. You're a size 10 with hips. You're a size 10 with no rear and the clothes will fit different on each of us. I think everything we're learning, like in long arm quilting, piecing, making, it's all not going to cater or fit to us, to our ability to work. Um, I just learned, I learned from mistakes. I, I learned from failure. Um, I really don't learn that much from success. As a matter of fact, I think I kind of, kind of, um, sleep, like, like just be a robot. And when I'm succeeding, I think, <laughs> and sometimes I hate it when I fail. I hate it. I get so mad at myself. You know what? I hear so many stupid I did. Y'all want to hear my stupidity? <laughs> yeah, binding without binding. Yes, that was one of my first videos that really started doing well. Um, 
Um, you want to hear something stupid? The other day I took a job. Now I'm on kicking myself. <laughs> I took a decal job. Okay, and sometimes in the morning, I get bombarded with jobs like, can you do this job? And can you do this job? Can you do this job? And they're easy jobs. So I think, I think they're easy. I think they're easy. Um, yeah, and let me just say, red snappers are great, okay? They're just not great for me. <laughs> um, so I'm just sharing. And so I took this decal job, and uh, all of a sudden, this lady said what she wanted, and then she changed it. So now this client who was supposed to be easy is like problematic, you know what I mean? And I literally ended up spending like three hours, like, do you like this design? Do you like this design? Do you like this design? And then she has me on hold for like an hour and then finally it says, can you share something else? And so I did this design, this design. Stupid. Let me just tell you. So this job was a $6 job, a $6 decal job. And I spent four hours on this $6 decal job. <laughs> and then when I went to, finally she made a decision on this $6 decal job. <laughs> I got so mad at myself. Like I got pissed at myself. Because um, <laughs> on the Cricut design program, if you don't have to buy designs, but what happens is, it's sometimes you do have to buy designs. And so I had to buy the design. And guess how much that stupid design cost me? $5.50. And I was so mad at myself five hours later on this easy job that <laughs> I didn't want to deal with her for another four hours to decide on another like font design. So I paid the $5.50 and charged her $6 for the decal. <laughs> you know what I learned that day? Do not take jobs like this no more. Do not take $6 jobs. Ever. And then the next day, I came up here and I did three quilts. And in those three quilts, I made $100 a quilt. And in two hours, I did a hundred dollars. And another two hours, I did another hundred dollars. Another two hours, I did a hundred dollars. Right. In the six hours that I did a six dollar decal job, I did three hundred dollars in six hours, give or take. And I learned something about myself that just because someone's asking me to do something like that, does not mean that that's a job I should take. And I should take jobs that are worth my money. Now, my thought was, she's going to know the font she wants. It's going to take me 10 minutes to do the decal. And the, 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 the decal material only costs like a couple dollars, like 50 cents, maybe, in total. But I was like, I spent six hours with this stupid lady. And I'm the idiot that took the job. And on top of that, you accidentally showed her a font that you're going to have to pay for. And to save myself time, I bought the decal font, the font, did the decal and, and, and just paid her back. But recently I was offered a job to do embroidery and this person's thinking, well, then I'm going to charge only like a dollar or two. And I said, no, I want $5 per item. And they got mad. $5. I go, yes, I rather not do the work than do work that I'm not going to successfully make some income out of. But that failure that I did last week with the decal kind of got me more serious about what kind of work I took. And I think I was mad at myself. Like, you're dumb. What were you thinking? Just, But I learned, like, just because someone wants me to do something doesn't mean I have to take it. And that was a wonderful, well, it was wonderful, it wasn't wonderful when I was frustrated doing the decal that I made nine cents on. <laughs> I made nine pennies. I could find nine pennies in my backyard. I'm not, just, I'm not saying nine pennies isn't important, but I sure did get a lot of wisdom from that mistake. And so, um, but that was like a management, bad management decision. And so, yeah, I would, yeah. Well, it, okay, and let me just say this. The, the quilt that I unstitched, 
and I finally long armed it. Um, I lost money on that, and I lost money because I lost the time. But um, let me just share this God sees it all, and I told God, I'm trying with all my heart to do the right thing. I'm trying with all my heart to do my best job and it was my mistake. It was my fault and it's a good thing, but I'm, I'm trying to fix it. Right. I went to this meeting, um, and I was really discouraged cause that job broke my spirit. I went to this, uh, this meeting and this lady says, Hey, do you want some fabric? And I'm like, yeah, I'll take the fabric, but I may not keep it. Cause you know, people give you dirty, gross fabric. They kind of like, bless you with their trash sometimes and so I was like yeah I'll take it because I'm teaching um, my own classes and my own quilting bees and so I said well I could use that fabric for that and um or or if not I'll just give it away to people who would want it and then I will buy fabric that I'll use that I like and um I was so discouraged y'all don't know I was so discouraged I was like broken because of that quilt I was just like you know, but then, okay, so I was broken because I can't believe what I did to myself, one. Two, I was proud of myself because I can't believe that I did that quilt, despite it. And it's beautiful after I quilted it. It, I mean, I'm a genius, man. Like, I'm, I, I'm happy with myself. I'm happy that I did the best I could, even in the mess that I made. So I went to this meeting, and I walk in there, and they have this fabric for me. And, um, I was given a thousand dollars worth of fabric from, um, oh my God, fat quarter shop, a thousand, I think it was more like maybe $1,500 worth of fabric from the fat quarter shop. And I, when they gave me the fabric, I started crying. I started crying because they didn't know what hell I put myself through. They had no idea. They don't know what kind of hell of a week that I had. And um, they don't know that my uh, my body was hurting. They don't know. But they gave me $1,500 worth of fat quarter fabric. And I started crying. And I... I um, but uh, I think God sees you. You know what I mean? If you're doing it right and you try to do it with the right attitude and you try to be thankful in failure, um, God will see you and God will reward you. And I, I told them, I go, I'll pay you for the fabric. Like, you don't need to give it to me. Like, I'll pay you for it. I, I mean, honestly, I think um, next time if I do a live feed, I'm going to come and show off that fabric. Because to me, um, I lost money on the quilt. I had to buy new back fabric. I lost days on that quilt. And, uh, but you know what? I was proud of myself because I did the right thing. I took care of that client. I, I did it right. And, um, and when I walked in that place, I was just like, okay, have a good day. Just don't look at it like that military soldier is like, just don't look at it. Don't look at the cost. Don't look at the burden. Don't look at the whole, the hindrance. Just go. And I quilted it. I gave it to the, the quilter, the, the lady. Um, she was so happy with it. And she did not know. <laughs> she did not know. She knew I had to fix it, but she didn't know what I went through to fix it. And uh, when they gave me that fabric, it wasn't about the fabric. It was that God saw. Um, that God saw that I did the right thing anyway. And um, man, I left there with bags. You, I need to show you this fabric. This is a God fabric gift. Like, um... And I told the people, like, why would you do this for me? Why? Would, and they said, you know, Lorena, we see that you bless a lot of people and that, oof, that you give a lot to a lot of people in them. And you, we just want to invest in you. And, and we see that people just don't see what you've done. And we see it. And we just want to invest back in you. And I was just like, 
um, just like, wow, thank you for the problem. You know, thank you, God, for the problem. And I think sometimes, um, thank God for the problem because uh, that's where you show that, uh, where you go beyond yourself and when you could be a better version of who you are. And I was proud of that quote. Uh, um, I'm sorry. I was really proud of that quote because um, I earned my stripes with that quote. I, I earned... Um, I, I felt like it. the quilt didn't conquer me, that I conquered the quilt and the problem didn't overtake me, but that, that I, um, that I really, that I accomplished something with myself, but I learned tricks. I learned perseverance. I learned long suffering. I learned determination. <laughs> I, I, I learned to be an overcomer. And so I know it's stupid to say like a quilt could teach you so much about yourself, but I think failure can do that for you. And then I also saw, um, God love me through people. Um, cause I was like, damn, uh, I don't want to do this no more. And, uh, when they gave me that fat, I went home like a little girl with, um, you know, like that little girl, that unicorn girl with um, delectables too. That little girl that had that unicorn, and then one of the little guys, the yellow guys, took her animal and burned it, and then he took her to the the to the playground, and he won her that big giant unicorn. And she's like, best day ever. I feel like God's like that for us, um, that. That he'll he'll just love you. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going into this, but yeah, failure is a blessing. Now, at the time when I was unquilting that quilt, um, I was like, "What is why is this happening to me?" But man, um, they really bless me. The people, um, those people that are rejected, right? The people from that the guild kind of shuns and like whatever's those are the people that bless me with this fabric and uh god i just love them and now i want to do anything for them not because of what they did for me it's because they saw me and uh so find people that see you and um that see you and but yeah oh my god that quilt and i you know i love that quilt that person who has that quilt, I prayed <laughs> while I was unstitching it, and um, and I prayed for the person that was gonna lay under it, and I asked God to help them, and and just that, he, I asked God to help me to have a good attitude and be thankful. I mean, it's just fabric, right? But in everything, just give it to God and do it for Him. But I, I've learned that, that lesson, like that military guy. And I said, Lord, we're making military quilts for them. Man, how many times have we turned a blind eye on their suffering and just kind of took it for granted? And and they just did it. And they went forward and they just did it for us. And they didn't even consider themselves um, so like when I'm doing those quilts for the quilts of valor, um, I think about the people that they're going to, maybe that's the one moment that they're being seen and appreciated, but going to that meeting, God, I drove there. I didn't want to go. I was discouraged. I was kind of like the week was hell. Um, but I went and I cannot believe, I mean, you, <laughs> It, you know, like those big bags where, um, the fat quarter shop where you literally buy the whole pattern, every single material to make that pattern. And they're like $299 or $190. And then the back fabric to go with it. I ended up getting like 20 of those from them. And, um, I'm like in awe, like, and I'm not a fabric person, but I was shocked. But I was more shocked about the love that they offered me. And I was crying in front of them, like I'm crying in front of y'all. And I was like, why would y'all even do this for me? I just love what they said. We see you. 
and we appreciate you. And so, Sandra, I appreciate you. You know, just do it unto the Lord, girl. Just do it unto the Lord. And uh, and do it for the people that are getting that beautiful quilt. You know, just don't look at it. Just keep on stitching. <laughs> just, you know. But I just want to encourage all of you. Like, failure is a blessing. Because um, it shows the best version of yourself. And it even shows the worst version of yourself. Um, if you allow God to use that, you can um, you could really see a version of yourself that uh, that no one else needs to see. And from from that moment, that quilt was so hard. Let me just say this: I know I can fix anything. Like there's something in me. Like if I fix that, I can fix anything when it comes to quilting. <laughs> I can fix it. Like there's nothing that's gonna hold me back. Like that military guy. And I, I know how he learned what he learned. By suffering through it. And by just doing it anyway. And by not looking at it. And so. I'm sorry I'm crying up here. But it's we've been here two hours. Can you believe it? I just. um I appreciate you coming on here. And I really am sorry for not posting videos. But I'm just kind of sharing what kind of happened to me. Um. A week or two ago and why I haven't been posting I just wanted to fix my clients quilt and instead of doing YouTube videos and editing like I should be that's what I was working on I was gonna I was trying to make sure that I did my client right that I took care of her and um, my clients real sick who I who I quilted this for and I, I realized when the Lord told me Lorena um, he says, Lorena, she's going to die on this quilt. So, uh, so do it with a lot of love. And, uh, and, and she's real sick. And so how can I not give her an excellent quilt? An excellent, beautiful quilt. I, I couldn't give her, because one of my thoughts were, well, I'll just give her the quilt for free even though it's done wrong. And uh, I heard the Lord say, she's gonna die on this quilt, Lorena. So, uh, um, I'm so sorry. So, uh, take care of her. And so I did the quilt. Um, Cause uh, she's real sick. And I know that she, she loves the quilt, like she loves it. And uh, she loves the quilt. And I know when she, she sleeps on it because it was done right, she's going to enjoy it every day she walks around, you know, walks into the room to go to bed. When she sleeps under it, she's going to, like, really love it. And so it's not just that. Um, it wasn't just that I'm doing a job, if that makes sense. Um, so I prayed for her a lot when I was fixing that messy quilt. Oh my God, I can't believe I'm on here crying. And so, uh, yeah. But I, I heard the Lord say, Lord, I know she's going to die on that quilt. So don't look at it. Fix it. And, uh, and even then, it was my mistake. It was my failure, right? Um, he still blessed me. He still loved me. He still, like took time to put in someone's heart to bless me and I think um, just doing the quilt and finishing it and handing it to her and seeing her happy kind of gave me a lot of peace about what I was processed through and so uh, it's not just about the money guys um, it's not just about um, it's like people love people love them out there Love them. And whatever you're doing, however you're serving them, serve them with a lot of love, you know? It may be the last time you, you get to be part of their lives. I've done some quilts for, like, old ladies, and I've loved them, and I've done stuff for them, and and uh, and they're not here anymore. And But I know that, you know, that I treated them well. 
And so you have an ability because the the old their older clients, my clients are a bit older, that you could make them happy. And you can give them like, there was one lady I was helping. Um, she was alone in her house, and I did a quilt for her, and she started sewing. So then I started sewing her quilts, and they were so bad. But I love that she found, she wanted to sew because she saw my quilting. Then she went to an elderly community. And then I, she forced me to start teaching there. And I, I would teach at, at the community she was at. And um, uh, she would still make her ugly quilts. They were ugly. and um, But I quilted them. And her kids thanked me because um, they got to see and have her little quilts that she made. And I, made them, I went out of my way to fix them and quilt them real pretty and just make them as lovely as I could so her kids would cherish them. And, and um, she's not here no more. But her kids love her quilts because in the last days of her life, I got to be a part of it. I got to be um, part of it somehow. And so, yeah, that quilt was hard, but God was good. So I'm sorry I'm crying. It was supposed to be like a, let's have fun on YouTube and all. Well, pouring my heart out. So Sandra, I'm sorry. I'm going to be praying for you. And, um. I know you guys are looking at making money, but do stuff for other people and God will bless you with the resources, bless you with resources so you could do it. He'll bring the right people around you. He'll help you and just do it right. So, uh, we've been here for quite a while. I don't even know how long we've been here. Two hours and 30 minutes almost. And I'm so sorry I'm keeping you from your family, but I want you to know that I really appreciate uh, that you take time and that you let me into your life. And um, I just want to encourage you uh, that God is good, that God is really, really good. And uh, next time I do a live feed, I'm going to show you all that fabric that they gave me. Um, I feel I feel like that spoiled little orphan girl that had got a big giant unicorn and is like best day ever. <laughs> and just appreciate the little things and but I'm excited for what God's gonna use that fabric for and um, the classes that I'm gonna teach and uh, what were your suggestions in making money, girl? Um, you can um, literally make baby quilts and sell them. And all you have to do is just quilt them and you can sell them. But I suggest that you get a Cricut cutter. If you want to really make decent money, get a Cricut cutter and start doing t-shirts and cut vinyl. You can do vinyl decals. Okay, don't don't listen to my dumb suggestion where I, lost, I made nine cents. Um, it's just I made a mistake but yeah you can I think whatever you do if you give it to God God will help you make money if, if you let him help you if you let him teach you if you listen to him he'll help you because he did for me I never even knew about long arming until I had a dream well I saw a video on PBS and then I had a dream of that I got one I, long arm quilting was never a thing for me I always wanted uh, embroidery has always been the thing for me and honestly embroidery wasn't even a thing I didn't even know you can make money on embroidery I didn't even know you can make money on making t-shirts um, so it's out there people make money on making stickers for planners so you can make stickers on a Cricut cutting machine and sell them on Etsy for planners. You can make patterns and sell them on Etsy. Um, it's a, yes, it's a fluffy unicorn, yes. So I'm hoping that I'm gonna be editing videos again and things are gonna go smoother. That's my hope, but I don't know. <laughs> Who knows? I bought my first embroidery machine a couple months ago. Yes, um, Deborah, if you got your embroidery machine, I recommend you go and look for youth associations. First of all, learn your machine, 
learn your embroidery machine I recommend that instead of buying one needle that you buy a six needle if you want to do a business with it but go to um, youth associations and you could put um, name on socks you could put their number their team number on socks you could put embroidered lo uh, names on t-shirts on on jerseys yes and you can make a lot of money I've made a lot of money doing youth associations and doing embroidery and when um, excuse me embroidery season comes in I do a lot of money doing vinyl um, using a vinyl cutter and I use the Cricut you don't have to use that big giant long machine you can use a Cricut cutting machine to cut vinyl and cut names on vinyl and heat press shirts and um, I did a video on that how to make uh, just put Loren t-shirt business and put Lorena I literally have run through what size the lettering what font to use how much money you can make through a sheet of vinyl like I have shared some stuff up here um, I've also done videos on how to make stickers on Word Microsoft Word and because there is a sticker thing going on where people planners are using are buying stickers like crazy on Etsy so there's a lot out there um, so to make money to find resources just find something you love and and then do it with all your heart and it'll grow it did for me that's how I got into all this I just fell in love with the embroidery machine my single needle uh, Deborah uh, Deborah's uh, craft shows are hard because People who go to craft shows want to buy things cheap. So if you want to do cheap crafts and and kind of price yourself very cheap, you'll probably get a, a good amount of sales. Uh, you know what you could do if you do craft shows that sell very well? Pillowcases. And use pillowcases like A&M pillowcases, UTSA, Texas State, whatever state, Michigan State, or New York State um, fabric, whatever make pillowcases and sell them they sell like hotcakes um, pillowcases at uh, craft shows if you price them well because I know a friend who used to do pillowcases and she used to make a buttload of money but she used like made pillowcases Superman Wonder Woman Snoopy fabric and she would make really pretty pillowcases. I bought four of them from her and because they were cool. And so, um, yes, just play with your machine, learn your machine. My first embroidered machine was a Singer Talent, Singer XL 6000. It's a one needle embroidered machine. Um, but what happens, it, it's very slow single needle embroidery machines are very slow and if you want to make a lot of items and sell a lot of things time is huge so my second machine when I fell in love with embroidery I got a six needle six needle baby lock embroidery machine I recommend right now you can go on Etsy and eBay no eBay they sell six needle embroidery machines pretty on the cheap do not get the PR 600s or the embroidery EMPs because you can't find parts for them anymore. So I recommend you get a, a Brother PR620 or above because you can still get parts for them. But you can get really, they're, they're expensive, but they're cheaper than new. Or even I would recommend you get new if you could get it on sale because you will get your money back if you work the machine. I bought three machines and I am getting to this day. I got my first machine in 2002. In 2002, and uh, to this day, I paid five thousand dollars for that machine. The first year I started working on that machine, just in three months, I earned six thousand um, dollars. And then I only worked like seasonally because I did baseball. I did baseball season and then I did football season, and um, in baseball season. I would make like six grand in football season, which is the opposite end of the year. I would make like two or three grand. 
So I, and I was with my kids at the time, so I didn't really work it that much, but in those two seasons I did. And so, um, and I did that for seven years. So that machine, I could say maybe brought in six, depending on the year, right? And depending on my mood, I could say I made $6,000 each year I had that machine. So that machine paid for itself. It paid me $60,000 in 10 years, and I only paid five for it. Then at, in the middle of that time, I bought another machine, and I paid eight grand for that. So now I had two machines, so I could do double the work. And that didn't even include P, the clients that I met in the baseball seasons. I did towels for them, backpacks. Like right now, I'm getting a onesie job, where I'm getting 34 onesies, and I'm doing lettering in front. And I'm also getting, I think, 50 towels where I'm going to put one initial on them and I'm charging, well, $4 per towel and I'm getting 50, I think. If she brings them all, they're supposed to be coming tomorrow. And also, um, I have another towel job where I'm making $10 a towel and I'm doing 10 of those. So, um, and I'm not even in my busy embroidery season. So... Um, there's ways of making money, but I think the best way to make money with the less cost, initial cost, is vinyl. Get, get, get yourself a Cricut cutter and buy yourself a good heat press. And my daughter is doing very well doing that kind of business. Uh, but I have videos, literally, I have shared on vinyl cutting business, a t-shirt business. If you put uh, Lorena and t-shirt business that video will pop up on you and um, the cost of vinyl is cheaper than the embroidery thread so and then you can make decals you can make decals for cups decals for cars decals are only 30 the it is like 30 cents for a little bit of decal I mean the whole thing of decals like three dollars and a little square like this is less than 30 cents and you make five dollars on it and you can do decals that are uniquely you that that are your style and type i mean y'all seen decals on cars right um someone paid ten dollars for them but the, the the vinyl to do that decal only cost 20 cents so there's money out there for you to make now it's not abundant money now you're not making a hundred dollars a shot but you're making five dollars and if you have one person you do it for one person and then 20 people ask you so you've made a hundred dollars and to cut a decal sheet will cost you five ten minutes yeah you can make some money now I messed up because I'd used the wrong font when I did that decal for that girl but but it was just like a dumb fumble on my part, but now I have the font and I made nine cents and the client's coming back for more, but um, there's ways of making money out there and people are willing to spend $5 instead of, a lot of people don't wanna spend $300 on a quilt top. A lot of people make quilt tops and then they don't even quilt them because it, to them, and it is, it's expensive, to go to a long armor and so you have to be someone who is financially stable retired and has that extra resources and but not everybody has that but everybody has five dollars for a decal or for a decal for a coffee cup do you understand what i'm saying and so you have a more open base of people who would be interested in your product and some people will buy one and some people will buy 20. Some people will buy 100 decals. And so the cost is less with a higher return of revenue. But long arm quilting, you're investing like thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000. And it, it takes longer to get that money back. But And you have to be very determined. So I guess I'm just sharing. There's ways of making money. I love my embroidery work. Like right now I'm going to do like the onesies. Um, I'm charging $5 per onesie and I think she's going to give me, she's going to give me quite a bit. Well, she got mad, but I told myself, remember the decal debacle? If I don't want to do it, I'm going to start charging for it. I mean, I'm going to make it worth my time. 
that six dollar decal showed me like your time is just as important than just doing the work for someone and so um, but I have videos for those things so that you could kind of get an idea the cost to start that is so my daughter's doing it and she's doing very well um, yeah she's doing really well and I don't like it you know what I mean I could be doing it and I could be focusing on embroidery too but um, I really love long arm quilting I love embroidery though it's fast money like I could embroider it in an hour and a half like all those Wendy's and towels maybe two hours maybe one hour because I have a couple machines and I can make two hundred dollars in maybe an hour because I'm using two machines but some of you don't have two machines so um, I grew into it and so I started with a one needle but if you really do want to do an embroidery business I recommend a six needle embroidery machine and brother and baby lock have they're both the same machines and they do specials and so I would look into specials um, I recommend you get a new one because what you put into it you know what you put into it you would put, put it through and I lost a motor on one of them and it only cost me a hundred dollars to repair so those six needle embroidery machines are not that expensive to fix um, but I started in 2002 and now I'm in 2021 and I just recently got a brand new one a 10 needle embroidery machine which I'm having problems learning because it's a bit different than my six needles but I'm using it and but and it hurts my soul <laughs> I'm, I'm paying payments on it I paid fourteen thousand dollars no more I think I paid more maybe fourteen thousand dollars and I'm making a hundred and I'm being honest I'm being straight I am making payments on it and I'm paying a hundred and eighty dollars no yes a hundred and eighty dollars a month for that ten needle yeah but I but I already have embroidery clients and I already have a couple other machines and so my one broke and I didn't think I could fix it so I bought this one and so I know what embroidery can do for me and so it is bringing in money I am working but it's not bringing long arm quilting kind of money because I could quilt a quilt for a client and make three or four hundred dollars on one quilt if especially if it's a big quilt and so but not everybody has that kind of money but to embroider a t-shirt people will do the t-shirt doesn't make sense what I'm saying but I don't want to keep you guys on here we're almost on three hours so but there is money out there I just wanted to share it um, I just want to appreciate you and thank you and um, but th that's I, I also have videos on my embroidery machines I'm not pushing my videos but I do talk about them on my channel they're older videos and so I'm a little bit long-winded and I'm talking forever but um, hi Liz how you doing um, I'm sorry if I didn't acknowledge you um, so yeah just there's ways out there to um, to to make income but I think the the best way the fastest best and cheapest way is vinyl to be honest and that I just I don't um, as a matter of fact schools they asked people they asked me a year or two ago if I would do decals for them and cut them for them and they would sell them for like funding for like uh, fundraisers but they would pay me a portion and then they would sell them for a higher portion I was gonna do that I was like well I don't have time for that I, I'm at this stage I think of 50 I want to do what I want to do if I want to do it when I was in my 30s when I was doing embroidery I was desperate to make money to feed my kids so um, yes Deborah it's a great do it I'm not saying no do whatever you want to do it's it's um do a practice play try do anything Deborah on your embroidery machine if it's gonna motivate you to mess with your machine so you can learn it go for it do towels just uh, just use a stabilizer a water-soluble stabilizer and Deborah go to embroidery no all stitch.com for embroidery supplies they are so 
price well and they have embroidery thread the big spools for seven dollars uh, but it's embroidery no um, and embroiderymecom has embroidery designs that you could buy but um, allstitch.com uh, allstitch.com yeah allstitch.com embroidery supply company um, you can get your threads and everything there so I thank you for being here sorry I was crying man I apologize I wanted to just cheer you guys on and encourage you and um, uh, thank you for watching yes have a good uh, what is it Memorial Day tomorrow have a wonderful holiday tomorrow my husband's gonna be off so he's like okay you could be up there <laughs> oh, corner. have a good night tangle zest yeah I, I get it we're off we're fixers even in quilts so uh have a wonderful night okay guys thank you so much i love you in the lord okay all right bye let me see stop